Welcome to this instalment of the Into the Wilderness podcast. I have to apologise that it is a day late. In fact, we talk about it in this show about never being late. We were late once and we talk about it in this show and we're late and it's due to me. Um, I fell down a big hole and I've been in a hospital for the last two weeks now. So it's, it is entirely my fault. Well, I, I don't think you're really to blame, but yeah, we've had... Things going on that have meant that I've been away doing other work and Daryl's been basically lying on a sofa for the mm, last 10 yeah. days. But uh, Last week wasn't good. No. <laughs> you, you should probably just explain it. You've had a lot of uh, messages from people saying get well, but you yeah. should probably just explain to people what happened because we were shooting, but it wasn't actually a shooting accident. Yeah. Uh, so basically, I was uh, walking in a field and uh, we'd just basically f- finished a drive of, uh, of pheasants and uh, I took about three steps into a field and I disappeared down like a five foot hole uh, that was like a drainage ditch and I split my knee open and uh, and broke my arm uh, in the same in the same go and my yeah. face full of nettles. Dal didn't know what part of his body was most painful I, I at the time. I didn't really know what was going on to be honest and then uh, unfortunately two days after I had a, a nasty infection in my leg which spread throughout my whole leg so I've been fighting that for the last week and a half and I, I still unfortunately still have it uh, but it is getting better. Yeah, so the, there's actually no hunting on the cards for Daryl yeah. anytime soon, actually. They, they do say if you go into hospital at the weekend, you've got a 30% higher chance of dying, and I would say that's true because I went in at the weekend <laughs> and got an infection on the Monday. So. Oh, dear me. So, yes, he he's still alive because he's on the podcast here, although a day late. But yeah. I think that that's a reasonable reason for bringing you this podcast a day late. But it is a rather fantastic podcast. We have a repeat guest on. We've got Adam Yankee from the Journal of Mountain Hunting, uh, Beyond the Kill podcast from uh, british columbia canada mm-hmm. uh he was on probably more than a year ago now it must be about um, a year we are big fans of his podcast i listen to it a lot i've been building my garage recently at home and it's been keeping me company uh well i've been busy building my garage uh because he's uh, their podcast is actually out now weekly so if you don't know them go over and check them out we speak to adam uh, we we get on to a whole variety of topics but if i boil it down to just two we are going hunting in new zealand next year about june time uh, with joseph peters from hard yards hunting and adam was hunting with him last year so we wanted to speak to him about his experience and basically give us some tips on preparation so you're going to hear a little bit about his hunt in new zealand and what we're going to be doing from now and well i'll say from now once daryl's legs better for him <laughs> yeah. uh, until June next year to get ready for our hunt. I'm hoping by December time I should be fully I hope so. fully functional again because, um, yeah, right now I can't bend it properly. But, we'll but that's okay. not all we talk about. No. Uh, another big topic of conversation is something we actually mentioned very briefly on a podcast, a few podcasts ago, which is the restriction in hunting in British Columbia on grizzly bears. So that has happened, and Adam goes into great depth on it. So I I will let him carry on and explain, but it it really is fascinating what's happened there and what the outcome's been. Very political. So that is what is coming up in this show uh, and we've got a couple of things to mention. Uh, one, well, I think. Oh, are you going to mention the shop? Yes, that's just. I had was first thing okay. on my list actually. Well, uh, we have got a huge host of designs. I think there's three t-shirt designs. Yep. Uh, one new mug design, and it's uh, a tin mug that you can like take camping and stuff like that. Uh, the, the mug was actually came out due to requests of people asking for more of a robust one that they could put in a like a camp bag or something like that. And we probably have two mugs, more mugs on the way. Uh, really cool designs. They're, the orders have been coming in really fast. So it's been we kind of crazy, really appreciate actually. it. Right now, I think we we'll probably have another week left, I would say, on the, the pre-orders because we will soon be getting the stock in. Uh, so the and then we, the prices go and up. And the prices go up. So uh, get your order in now. If but thank you for the want. support. Yeah, it, because it does. It helps us out massively. It enables us to do 
shows like this and and uh, loads of little extra things and give you more entertainment. <laughs> but I th- I think uh, well we have to say thanks to Beth actually who's my girlfriend because she's been. Uh, although we've given the direction, she's been the kind of brains behind yeah, a lot of the designing, yeah. uh, and I think we've we've got some pretty cool stuff out there now. They're, I would say unique. Yeah, pretty unique. It has a re- it has everything has a kind of the same look and feel yeah. about it, and I think it's the a one theme of the that's, kind. You won't yeah. see that get these anywhere else. Definitely not. So go on to thepacebrothers.com. I think basically everything out. is ten pounds right now. T-shirts are ten pounds. The mugs are less. The mug is eight, eight pounds. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so yeah, but that is probably yeah at most another two weeks. So go and check that out before the prices go up. In two weeks' time, the next podcast that is out, we are going to be bringing you some unique discounts and deals, which is one day before Black Friday uh, from Scott Country. So a lot of night vision and thermal and all that good stuff that they are well known for. So that's all I'm going to say on this podcast is that you need to listen to our next podcast on the Thursday. So it'll be out in the morning or m- maybe even the, the Wednesday night uh, late on. Listen to it so that you can get a heads up on the deals that will be coming out on the Friday. Um, so you you are warned. Don't listen to it a week later and then complain that you didn't know about the deals because <laughs> yeah. we're telling you now with two weeks' notice. So if to listen you're to in podcast. the market for thermal, night vision, uh, uh, or if, in fact, just have a scout on the Scott Country website mm. and... You you might find something, and it might come up on the Black Friday deal. So I, I, we, there might be some unique stuff because they uh, do have more well. than that as well. Yeah, there is. So go, go and check that out. We mentioned our, our film festival, and it is we're just starting to ramp up the exposure of that now. Uh, the film festival is going to be uh, announced. The winners are going to be announced at the Northern Shooting Show next year, 2018. The entries are currently open. All of the information is on the website. Just go on to thepacebrothers.com, hit film, and you will find uh, all the information in the in the drop-down menu there on the film festival. And if you actually want to enter, then just go into our shop and you will see the two entry um, requirements that is amateur and professional. I should also mention that we will be giving away free entry codes uh, for prizes. So keep an ear out and keep an eye out for that because we're going to be talking a lot about the film festival in the coming months. Yeah, I'm super a, excited about it. There's a lot going it. on with that. So, And I should say that there so is... So definitely some... come to the Northern Shooting Show. Yeah. Don't hum and haw about it. Just go. Yeah. Book your time off now. Do whatever you need to do. It's over a weekend anyway. So that, that you shouldn't need time off work to do that. And I can actually share something that <clears throat> has been confirmed today is that on the Friday night, which is actually the evening before the show, the show's on the Saturday, Sunday, and on the Friday early evening, we are going to be having a private cinema showing uh, at the showground for a very limited number of people. Mm-hmm. There's going to be uh, a number of industry people in the, sort of the field sports industry are going to be there, and we are going to be giving away tickets for you, the general public, to come and see the shortlist of films on the Friday night, um, have a, have a have a drink if if you're able to have get a, a driver to take you home, uh, a few nibbles and also mix with a lot of editors and well-known people within there'll the be, industry. There'll be a chance to purchase tickets as well. Yes, there will. Uh, so, I would plan your weekend of the Northern Shooting Show now. So you travel up on the Friday, you book a hotel so you can have a few drinks. Uh, you come to the showing on the Friday night, then you enjoy the show on the Saturday. Mm. But there is going to be very limited tickets, so. Yeah. We will be t- probably releasing the information on that at the end of this month. Uh, so you really need to look at our social media and listen to the upcoming podcast. Uh, we'll also put that. out, um, if you subscribe to our website, we'll put out a thing to all our subscribers so that they get it as well because we know n- not everyone is on social media. And actually what we'll do is I will put the, the I will put the option out for tickets first to the subscribers of our website. That, that's fair. I think that's fair. So <laughs> yeah. thepacebrothers.com, if you go to the bottom of the page, you'll be able to subscribe to our newsletter. We don't put out very many. Uh, we put out one recently, and I think that was the first one in three months. So we're not bombarding you with rubbish. It's just when we have interesting things to let you know. And mm-hmm. I think this is worth knowing about. So, uh, And the last thing before we get to the show is the competition winners from two weeks ago and the new competition for today. First up, the winner from two weeks ago, which was a simple social media sharing exercise to win a vintage 
Hornady reloading sign, a set of surefire in-ear ear defenders, and a set of Smith Optics safety shooting glasses. It was a rollover because we hadn't given out the prizes from two weeks before. And the winner, randomly selected, is Andrew Kavanagh. So, Andrew, you just need to get in contact with us the usual ways, email, social media, find us somehow, send us a message, and we will send out your kit to you. And we have a new prize, of course. In fact, I just picked up a whole bunch of prizes um, from Edgar Brothers the other day, and we have um, a whole heap of Tipton cleaning products, including some Tipton gun vices and some cleaning rods and brushes and a whole heap of good stuff. So the competition for this podcast is going to be to win a Tipton cleaning rod for your rifle. And I think people need to send a picture of the rifle that's going to be cleaned. Yes, (laughs) perfect. Um, We will put up a post so you can either send it to us or uh, on our normal email address or you can just reply with the picture in the social media post. So whether you use social media or not, you'll be able to enter there, or you can send us an email. And I think that's about it. I think that's a wrap prior to uh, getting into this week's show. Mm -hmm. Enjoy. Uh, First of all, (laughs) I should say, I think you should probably put a hunting picture as your profile picture on Skype because you look a little bit like a convict. (laughs) <laughs> which one is, which one is it? you're in like a black oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with the, with the, with the <laughs> you know what i think it was one of those ones where i, I think i was setting it up and uh it forced it was like, you oh, to take a you, picture would you like to take a picture yeah. and i'm like oh, i guess and it was you know one of those days working from home home i probably, probably wasn't even wearing pants right the classic like tv interview thing right and i think we're gonna start the podcast with that <laughs> I'd love it. Hold uh, on, I'm, I'm gonna cue the video up one more one more time because I want to show you guys something. Okay, go for it. See my fancy uh, espresso mug. Uh, he, okay, for the, for those people who can't see it, it is a, a striped cat with a pink bow. Yes, yes. This this well, you, a, a very easy way to tell whether you have uh, kids that have taken over your home and you no longer keep and and uh, use nice things. Adam, uh, welcome to the podcast. You have been on before. I'm sure most of our listeners will be familiar with you. We do actually reference uh, your podcast on a pretty regular basis and and try and send some of our listeners over there. You've had some brilliant guests on, well, you you have since since the beginning, but recently I've I've really enjoyed some of the shows. And I, I might be mistaken, but are you doing it more regularly than you were when you started now? Yeah, uh, we are. We are. We moved to weekly, oh... A while back now, a few months back, um, we did have one week where we had two because um, my uh, podcasting equipment did not make the trip back from the northern BC mountains with me. And uh, I, of course, made the mistake of not planning as far in advance as I should have. I mean, you guys know what this is like, right? You've, you've got a, you know, a work-related trip, which usually means time you know, in the mountains, in the bush, something like that. Um, and you don't always have um, you know, access to all the things that you need to, to keep the, keep all the communications going. Absolutely, and yeah. so I hadn't, I hadn't booked my podcast far enough in advance, um, for one. And then two, I didn't even have the, the equipment. So I, I could have squeezed one in on a regular schedule, but we ended up just doing two in one week. So. Oh, that's good. No, I, I know what an undertaking it is doing every two weeks as we do. So weekly is a mammoth task. Get everybody, all the logistics sorted, get it all hooked up, get it recorded, edited out the door. It's uh, it's quite a lot of work. Well, and, and it was one of those, you know, sort of comedy of errors scenarios where, you know, the, the podcasting equipment was was sort of stuck in transit. Um, the, you know, I'd not, I mean, I, I should add, I I booked enough guests well enough in advance, but, you know, as, as you know, during hunting season, plans change, right? So a couple people canceled and then I was left sort of, you know, holding the bag, so to speak. And then, uh, and then, yeah, we just had to adjust the schedule. I mean, but that's the beauty of this stuff, right? I mean, I think, you know, your show, our show, we do um, a pretty good job of staying reasonably on schedule, like maintaining that sort of almost, you know, show worthy um, consistency. But at at the end of the day, you know, if we need to make a change, we can make a change. And uh, I think everyone, certainly in this, you know, community and industry understands that, uh, you know, time in the mountains, time in the bush, time in the fields, whatever it might be, um, are, are really what we're after here, right? 
Yeah, no, it, it, I, I think most people are fairly understanding. I don't think we've we've been late, but I don't think we've truly missed a date yet. But then, right. you know, once every two weeks, you have a little bit more. It was only uh, due to time. internet because we were hunting in a rural place that we were right. late. Yeah, right. Couldn't upload. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the one of the things that prompted me to think, you know what, we need to get Adam back on the show, is that we were contacted by somebody who you, I believe, got to know quite well last year, which is uh, Joseph from New Zealand, mm-hmm. from Hard Yards Hunting. Mm-hmm. And I thought, mm-hmm. and we're going over there next year to go and hunt with him. And I thought, you know what would be cool oh, awesome. is if we get Adam on to talk about his experience and your trip and your sort of pre-prep and what it was like being there now. And then we will be doing a podcast with him out there, a bit like you did in six mm. months from now. Um, so I suppose, I mean, that's a, a pretty good place to start. How did that come about for you, that trip uh, from BC to New Zealand? Yeah, great question. And, and just, you know, to sort of set the tone, uh, JP, um, as uh, we came to know him when we were there in New Zealand, um, you know, short for Joseph Peter, obviously, is, um, well, one of the most uh, competent guides I've been around now, I mean, I'll, I'll qualify that and say I've only that was the only guided hunt I've been on, but I do know and interact with a lot of guides in the and outfitters in the business, and he's um, he's yeah he's top top tier, right? An absolutely top notch guide. Um, he's very knowledgeable and passionate beyond just you know killing things, right? I mean, yeah. he's I as committed that. as anyone it, it came as across, committed as anyone yeah. to you know getting you the animal you want, but you know he knows the ins and outs of everything about these animals and, and the history of hunting in New Zealand. And, uh, I mean, he's just a phenomenal, phenomenal person. So, um, and then the second point actually is, um, he's also the hardest uh, bleep I have probably ever encountered. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold back. So, I heard you swearing on your podcast the other day. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, I, I want to be respectful yeah. of your platform. It's, it's not mine, right? We can always add beeps. We can always add beeps. Yeah. <laughs> But no, he, he, you know, he, I had an, an hour long conversation with him uh, and that, that's the sort of the most interaction I've had with him apart from emails. And I, I got on incredibly well with him. He has a, a brilliant ethos, which is very much along the same sort mm-hmm. of lines as what we have and what, what you have on your show, which I have to say is not necessarily that common in New Zealand. And it was really no. refreshing to hear that from him. And that was what, you know what, I got to try and make this work because this guy seems like just the kind of guy who's on the same wavelength as me. But he reminds me, like, just in terms of his character and how he looks, of another dude who I was hunting with in northern Sweden last year called Tommy Holmberg. And he looks very similar oh, to Oh, yeah, him. yeah, yeah. And he was an incredible character as well. And he has that same sort of feeling to him. So I'm very excited about meeting him in person. That, you know, it's true. I never put that together because, of course, we ran that that article you wrote about that hunt oh, um, course, in, our, yeah. in our print edition, right? I've not seen and, it yet. Uh, sorry? I've not seen it yet. I'm going to have to get my hands on that print edition. Oh, geez. You know what? I, I'll send you one. I absolutely I, – I had you earmarked for one and, well, it, I'll be honest. I, I put a, a list of, you know, sort of um, – people that had either written for us or I wanted to get it, get it in their hands. And, uh, I handed that off to somebody to take care of. And I, I swear your name was on it. No but stress. I, you know, I mean, it's a, it's, a, a, it's a sidetrack, but how did that, the print edition go? Because for, for those people who don't know on our podcast, uh, the journal of mountain hunting, it's an online platform, some fantastic, a lot of great long form articles on there, which I love, but this was your first sort of dipping your toes into the print. So how did that go for you, Adam? Oh, very well. I mean, we um, are are ecstatic or were ecstatic with the initial phase. We're into that phase where you need to uh, not just rely on, you know, brand and goodwill amongst your existing, um, you know, customer base and really start to you know, sort of invest in the growth of um, um, of, of the, of the platform, right. Of, yeah, of yeah. that specific part of the platform. But we were absolutely ecstatic with the initial response. It was fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, as a, as a side note to the side note, the, the foray into print was not without its, um, bumps in the road. <laughs> I mean, as, as, as anyone that has had any interaction with a website and, you know, from a back end perspective, will know, you know, it's pretty easy to fix things. If errors occur, you know, you see a grammatical error, it's like, oh, just, you know, log back in and, and tweak it. Right. Um, you can adjust things on the fly. You're not working with the sort of production schedules that you are when you're actually, you know, getting something physically, um, you know, printed or manufactured. 
So it de- definitely didn't go as smoothly as we wanted on, um, let's say the fulfillment side of things, um, which, you know, if anyone that is listening has purchased one and is, you know, in that camp where it took a really long time to get to them or it hasn't even arrived, which is, un- you know, as much as it ticks me off to say, I'm still getting emails where a person says, you know, I ordered it two months ago and I still haven't got it. Uh, and you know, the, the assumption is it was lost in the mail. So that fulfillment side was definitely, um, did not go as well as we would have liked. And we're, we're working our butts off to make that, um, or to get that fixed for the next edition, which is going to come out, uh, this December. Oh, brilliant. That's good. Uh, yeah. so I, anyway, if, if people want to know more about that, they can go and check on journal of mountain hunting and, and, uh, I'm sure that there's a link on there where they can find out about it. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, back to back to Joseph. How did that hunt come about for you? Yeah, so I mean, I, circling back to what you were saying about his ethos, um, you know, JP originally reached out to me, um, you know, wanting to sort of um, collaborate and work together, and it ended up that um, he decided to become one of our one of our sponsors, and he's um, been for almost two years now. Uh, his company, that is Hard Yards Hunting New Zealand is the sponsor of what we call our pro insight column, which is the, the column where we, um, run a, well, it's a monthly column where we run, um, you know, articles, um, and information predominantly from guides or industry professionals. Um, so, um, he's been working with us in that capacity for a long time. I was planning to do, uh, you know, yet another Northern BC hunt that I guess was last year. Um, and those plans fell through for a variety of reasons. And one of the guys that writes for me, who's a um, very, very, very competent um, uh, sort of a, he's not only a, a Rocky Mountain goat guide, but that's his, you know, bread and butter, his specialty, his passion. And he, you know, uh, guides other things um, as the season dictates. But he, um, he'd been talking to Joseph and he wanted to head over and he'd kind of, you know, planned for it and earmarked a timeline for it. So when my plans fell through, he just floated the ideas like, well, you know, dude, why don't you, um, why don't you come to New Zealand? And it was one of those things where, you know, I, I had, and I think this is probably different than, you know, from, from what you guys would think about, you know, hunting opportunities. I kind of had a mental block on international hunting opportunities just because there's a perceived cost element to it. Well, I mean, there's a real cost element to it. Um, that, you know, as a, as a BC resident, we have a hard time getting our, you know, sort of our, our butts over because we can hunt so many different things, um, so cheaply here. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I kind of chewed on it for a bit and then I was like, you know what, I would love to go back to New Zealand. And I, I lived in New Zealand for a year right out of university. I was down playing rugby, um, and, um, uh, on a, on a club exchange and I never got to hunt. Um, and so, uh, ever, ever since leaving, I've been dying to go back and, you know, I, I have a, I think we talked about this on the last podcast, but, um, I, I'm, you know, my, my passion from a hunting perspective is the, um, you know, the true mountain species, uh, sheep, goats, you know, high alpine mule deer, that sort of thing, elk, uh, as well. And so, um, I've always had a fascination with the, the Capernet, um, species. So, you know, Rocky Mountain goats, tar, ibex, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so it all just kind of came together where, you know, plans fell through. I had somebody that was already a good friend of mine that was already going. Um, I started to run the numbers and it really wasn't that expensive. I mean, as embarrassing as it is to admit a flight, you know, return flight to New Zealand isn't a whole lot more expensive than flying across Canada. Right. Oh, so really? it's, um, one of those things where just all the pieces started to fall into place. And then, you know, coming back to the ethos part, the big part was if I was going to go to New Zealand, I was going to do it one of two ways, 100% DIY, which you can do. Um, or like with, with, you know, buddy or a couple of buddies or with somebody that hunts the way, uh, Joseph does. And that's, you know, to your point, Byron, what makes Joseph really unique is he's a true wilderness, you know, mountain guide, um, and, uh, and really knows where to go and what to do and, um, and does it a way that certainly resonates with, uh, with me as a BC resident. And I think a lot of North American hunters, that's not to say the other, uh, you know, options in New Zealand are bad. They're just, you know, they're not for everyone and they're certainly not for me. But Joseph was, you know, as, as you pointed out about Tommy, you know, that, that died in the wool wilderness mountain slash man. mountain guide, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It looks like he w- he was born in the rocks uh, in, 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 the, in the best and kindest way possible. Yeah. Well, no, it's funny you mentioned you know, Tommy because I, like I, I did never really clicked, but you know, there's a couple of pictures 
in that article where he's got his, his shirt off and he's, you know, um, field dressing the moose. <laughs> yeah. And you're right. I mean, they have a very similar look. I mean, they're just wiry as all get out. You look like, look at them and think that they could, you know, get blown over in a stiff wind, yeah. but then you get into the, you know, the, the bluffs and cliffs and mountains with them. And they're just like, they're like spider monkeys, right? Yeah. They're just, they're in, incredible. And so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was a hell of an experience. I mean, I, I, I have to go back. I will go back and I will do it with JP without a doubt. Um, but it, um, it was a, I, I, I would almost say it was a wake up call for me in certain ways, that hunt. Yeah. I, I, I that's what I, one of the things I'd like to get into. I mean, you, you talk a lot in, in the journal and you talk a lot on your show about, uh, you know, supplements and, and training and a regime because it very much is, uh, focused towards the sort of mountain hunter, mountain athlete, and you need to be in good shape to be able to take those kind of hunts. So it goes hand in hand. It should be just the same as, uh, practice with your rifle or your bow on the range that's less so here it's a much less of a focus if a focus at all in in this country i would say but mm. were you did you have to prep for that trip or were you in a in a stage where you were sort of continually prepping anyway just because it was that part of the season for you yeah i mean i am um, i'm i'm prepping in some capacity I would guess I would say year round, like, and that's not to sound like a meathead. That's just, you know, I, I, frankly, I go bat bleep crazy if I don't get, you know, some sort of physical activity in. And and so over the course of a year, things will be cyclic for me. So I'll put more emphasis in say, you know, hiking with a backpack as we get into the, you know, early spring, summer, and of course into fall. Um, and then, you know, certain times there might be a little bit more weight training to prep the muscles for that load. Um, and sometimes it's just, you know, simple, you know, like light hiking and trail running and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm always doing something and that, you know, ebbs and flows with the realities of, you know, life and family and that sort of thing. But, um, I, uh, I don't, I mean, I was in a pretty, let's say high state of readiness for, for that hunt because it was the, just the time of year when I would generally try to be, um, that said, um, um, I definitely wasn't as prepared as I should have been in, in very specific um, sort of areas that that made that hunt especially tough for me um, physically, well, and, and and mentally. But then you know we can't separate those two. But those two things combined together made that the without a, a shadow of a doubt um, the toughest hunt I've ever been on. Well, I, that uh, is what I would rather like your insight on because given that we are we're going in uh end of may start june next year so we've got six seven months now uh mm -hmm. i'm busy doing some training for hunt coming up soon but six seven months basically of preparation specifically for this hunt sort of over and above the sort of stuff we do normally anyway <clears throat> and now with, with the knowledge and, and hindsight that you have what would your advice be based on the experience and where you fell short uh, find the most vertical terrain you can comfortably put yourself in or at least a starting point and build up to the point where you are worried about soiling your pants on any given day <laughs> and train in that as much as possible. Simple as that. <laughs> well, and I, I don't want to be like, I don't mean that to sound tongue in cheek, mm. but, uh, you know, the, you know, you, there's, I mean, I don't know how much detail you want me to, to dive into here, Byron, but you know, um, the, there's a, I'll do this as simply as simply as I can. So, you know, stop me if it, if I get down too many rabbit holes or whatever, but, um, when we look at a given, you know, task or endeavor, right. And this, this could be an event, right? Like let's say somebody that's just training for a triathlon that these, these basic principles apply, which are, um, depending on your level of fitness, when you choose to say, start, let's call it a program. Um, the start of that program, the first four to eight weeks will, um, will be dependent upon your current state of fitness, right? Um, so, you know, for the first, you, you guys have six to seven months, you said? Yeah. Yeah. So for the first little while, you know, the, the best thing I think you can do is, um, just spend as much time, um, hiking ideally loaded, right? So with a, some, some form of a, of a decently loaded pack, it doesn't have to be a, you know, crazily heavy and that's, you know, without jumping all over the map. One of the nice things with New Zealand um, is it's possible that you will not be hunting, as they would put it, from the tops, right? So depending on how you guys choose to to sort of um, you know execute the plan, um, you may get dropped by chopper up in the high country, and then you're basically going to stay up there and hunt down, right, down uh, onto the tar or the the chamois from there. Um, or, and this is what happened to us, you could have weather dictate that that's not possible. 
and you're going to be doing a you know very classic North American style hunt where you drive to a trailhead, you hike for miles and miles and miles, and you stop at either base camps or, and this is where the, the pack weight comes in, the beauty of New Zealand is they have that incredible hut system, right? And I can't remember how many huts there are scattered across New Zealand off the top of my head, but it's, it's an, an unbelievable amount. It's a wonderful, wonderful system. Um, so you have the advantage there of being able to leave a lot of your stuff, you know, out of base camp or in a hut, um, as you hike up from the valley bottoms. Now that up from the valley bottoms is, uh, <laughs> it is challenging. So, um, depending on, on the sort of the, the plan A and, you know, and then potentially plan B, C, et cetera, um, you may not need to be, you know, sort of accustomed to, um, hiking around and especially in vertical terrain with, you know, say 45 to 65 pounds, right. Um, unless you're going to have camp on your back for that whole time. Um, but back to the program side of things, um, you know, that first, you know, sort of third of that six to seven month chunk would be just, you know, kind of prepping the body for, um, harder, heavier, more exertional work. So just getting on a regular basis, hiking, you know, hills, I wouldn't say they would necessarily need to be mountains, but just kind of keeping the, uh, keeping the wheels greased as it were. Um, you know, some people believe in incorporating weight training. I certainly do. Some people don't. Um, I, I would think, or I would say you can probably take it or leave it. Um, it's not a necessity. Um, I don't think, but it does. Um, I think it has a positive impact later in the trip when your body starts to fatigue, the stronger you are, um, the specifically stronger, not just fitter, but the stronger you are, the better you can weather that fatigue. Um, in my opinion, I've, I've seen that with a lot of people. Um, so, and then from there, it's going to be as, you know, I, I, as I said, tongue in cheek, it's going to be, um, find the most vertical, uh, and scary terrain that's still hikeable. Like I'm not saying go to an ice climb or, you know, rappel and that sort of thing, but you know, that, that sort of stuff that starts to get into more scrambling, um, and spend time in that as much time as you possibly can. Because what I, what I was, I was physically prepared for the most part, um, but I was not um, mentally prepared, um, for basically being scared, gutless almost <laughs> every day. Uh, so now, now this some, you know, c contextually, um, you know, that, that's me, right. That, that may not, some other person may, you know, find themselves standing on the same bluff line that I did and go like, Oh, what's the big deal. Right. Um, and I will add that. And I, I think I said this, um, when we did a, what we would call a hot wash or like a sort of a post trip report after my hunt, that for me, what has changed there significantly is, uh, I've got two, two little ones at home. And so my, my risk tolerance has changed from what it was a few years ago. Um, but that being said, you know, we would have these, these really, really big pushes, these, these immense climbs from the valley bottom, thousands and thousands of feet of vertical gain and not a very, um, you know, long horizontal distance, like next to, you know, as, as close to straight up as you can get while still being, you know, hiking. Um, and then we get up to where the tar were and I was specifically hunting tar and, um, and I was bow hunting, which added to the issue of needing to get close and, you know, basically, you know, live and, and exist where the tar were. Um, and, uh, I was just, my adrenaline was just humming. There's the excitement of, you know, side of the adrenaline, but then there's the, like, if I slip, this is going to be bad and really bad. Um, and, um, and so that sort of almost underlying anxiety just wore me down on one stock in particular, the last stock where I had like a legitimate opportunity. We were hours on this stock and we had, you know, we got busted once and we froze laying in the snow for, you know, what felt like 10 minutes was probably two, but, um, and then we had to sort of change our plan and go around this, the, the face of this bluff that when I looked at it from the bottom, I just remember saying to myself, I'm not a very religious person, but consider it a prayer. Please don't have us go there. And that's exactly where we ended up. Um, and, uh, so after the stock, which ended up, um, not being, I didn't even loose an arrow to be honest. Um, uh, which you can see in our film actually. I was going to ask um, you about that because I have watched it, but where can people find the, the film for this hunt? Uh, so you would go to Talus. So T A L U S. Some people would call it Talus, Talus or Talus creative.com and look under their films. Um, Connor Gabbett, who, um, is the principal of that, um, has been working with me for a long time. And he, he was there in New Zealand to film, 
um, for that, or, well, for the exact purpose of filming. Um, and so there's one, there's one of the clips in there you'll see, um, um, us sort of side hilling across this bluff line, which doesn't, I mean, it never looks as bad on camera. Um, but, um, uh, crazy winds and, you know, I, I pop up at 30 yards trying to, trying to lose a, or to, to get a shot. Um, and the wind was so severe, I just couldn't steady, steady my bow and he takes off. But after that, after that exact moment, we'd been, you know, stalking for hours at that point, my adrenaline had been peaking and I literally sat down and could have taken a nap. Like legitimately my eyes got heavy and I was ready to go to sleep and we still had a, a multiple hour descent out of the mountain. We were pretty much at, at the summit. Um, and I, <laughs> I jokingly say like, I literally basically, I fell down the mountain more than I actually like hiked down the mountain because I was just so trashed. Gravity was your friend. <laughs> Gravity was definitely my friend. Yeah. So, I mean, the, 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 the primary point there is, um, I thought I was physically ready. Um, and you know, I, I, I think anybody that goes and does this sort of stuff can, can kind of gut it out. Um, but, uh, I definitely was not mentally prepared for, um, if you want to call it that sort of, I was not stress inoculated right to that sort of stuff. Um, and it wore me down physically, which then impacted, you know, the next day and the next day and the next day. Um, and that was because of how I basically pure fear in terrain that I was not overly comfortable in. And last note I'll make on that before I, I stop rambling here is I, I read this a ton beforehand and you guys have maybe come across it, but people always say, you know, New Zealand, the vegetation is sort of, you know, insidious, right? Like you, it looks it looks nice, right? You got these, these beautiful beech trees instead of, you know, evergreens and the valley bottoms and up the slopes. And then everything looks grassy. And then you get up into that stuff and everything is designed to either stop you from upwards, pro upwards progress or speed your downwards progress, <laughs> i.e. fall. Um, and I, I remember reading a, a story or an article at some point where the person made the comment that in New Zealand, you don't stay out until last light. You have to be descending by a certain point. Otherwise, you are basically risking your life because of just how um, how severe the fluctuations in temperature are, obviously how much moisture is, is in the country. So stuff that will be rain on this nice, you know, tussocky slope will be literally a, a frozen slip and slide when you want to be coming down by a headlamp, right? And so that was a very real thing. You know, I'd look at a, a side hill and it would look, you know, sort of grassy. And in BC, that grass, it would be some form of a bunch grass, would have pretty decent roots. And so you could like, you know, put your foot on the, you know, the slope side of the root or at the base of the plant and you actually have a decent little foothold. Well, in New Zealand, you do that and the grass just folds over. It's almost like, ha ha. And so it's you got know, nothing it holding it, it in. Well, yeah, there's just well, and it's and it's weird. It just doesn't have. Maybe it's because of the winds, the which would make sense that they're just blown around so much that they're just very, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, sort of floppy grasses. They just don't have that integrity. Um, I mean, they're there, but it's 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 not as secure a footing as you would th as as you would think, right? When you look at it. Well, yeah. What, what food did you uh, take out there to eat while you were there? No, um, I was. Uh, Using a combination of a pretty typical backpacking fare, um, there's a, a company called Heather's Choice. Uh, You've had her on, have Alaska you? on on the show. You've had it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, so she's she has a really interesting product because it's dehydrated, not freeze dried, um, which does require a longer steep time, like when you when you put the boiling water in. Um, but it, uh, it tends to have a much richer flavor profile. It's kind of closer to real food than freeze dried. And she, she makes her stuff uh, and it's not paleo, but very, you know, sort of whole food oriented. Right. So not a lot of, you know, I don't know if garbage carbs would be the way to put it, but you know, real food that has been dehydrated and then just sort of mass produced. Um, so for most of my, like my primary meals, I was using that. Um, and then a compilation of like, you know, energy bars or snack bars and that sort of thing. And it, I don't know if you guys can get it there, but my like, probably the most important and favorite thing I take on any backpack hunt now is something called moon cheese. Have you come across that? No. Uh, it's a great name, but no. no. What is moon so cheese? Yeah. So it's super, super lightweight. It's dehydrated cheese. And like nutritionally, it is literally like, like if you look at the ingredients, it just says 100% real cheese. Um, and so <laughs> like it's a, it almost has like, um, 
it's got like a crunch to it, right? Cause it's dehydrated, you know, very, very salty, which on, in these sort of endeavors, you, you know, you just always crave. Um, and obviously just, you know, pure rocket fuel as far as high fat, high calorie content. Um, and that is like, without a doubt, I just came back from a hunt in Northern BC, a uh, mountain goat hunt. Um, and I yet again, didn't take enough moon cheese because it's just what I crave like twice a day. Um, and so that was one of the, the, the key things. And it, obviously depending on temperatures, that high fat content's really important as far as maintaining, um, you know, sort of that, that thermogenesis, right? Like burning hotter and staying warmer, um, and lasting longer as far as the calories you take in. And especially if you guys end up in cool weather, you said you're going when June? Uh, yeah, June. Okay. Um, then, um, you know, you're going to be, so there's all the exertional side of, um, or the exertional side of, of the hunt, but if it's, if it's cold, you're going to be burning even more calories, right? Yeah, of course. And so those really high bang for the butt, calorically speaking, um, foods or snack options are really, really key. And the nice thing with moon cheese is it literally weighs next to nothing. Um, so you can just, you know, fill your pack with that sort of, sort of stuff for each individual, you know, days, um, you know, food bag with that sort of stuff. And, uh, you're going to get massive, you know, sort of calories per ounce car- carried. No, my brother's just Googling I, I just, it right now. The, the first thing I found was Wallace and Gromit on the moon when, it? when they flew. I don't know if you know Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> Do you know Wallace and Gromit, Adam? No. Oh, uh, it's, uh, you're missing out. It's it was a show that it was a uh, like an animated plasticine show and they stop animation. Yeah. And they uh, oh, they took they okay. took a, mo- a trip to the moon because it's made of cheese. And when I typed in moon cheese, that's what that's what came <laughs> up. You, for all, all the well, all of your listeners and the Canadian residents who, <laughs> who don't know uh, who don't know Wallace and Gromit, I'm sure you can find some clips of it on YouTube. It was at the time when it was out. It was it was brilliant and it's still brilliant today and it is plasticine it's, it's, models it's by the my, well, this uh, is an amazing side chat it is <laughs> the, the same guys made um chicken run and oh uh, yeah 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 it's, okay. it's the same guys that made all, all those things but i mean i think the first waltz and grunt must have been out in the the 80s it uh, must have prob- been maybe early 90s yeah maybe yeah. early 90s and they've had a few recent ones uh but yeah it's 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 a it's a kind of a children's show, but it's quite good. Yeah, but we're we're gonna look up moon cheese and see if we can get some yeah. over. So at least we can try it and see if it, uh, see if we can get it over at a reasonable enough rate to be able to take it over to New Zealand with us. Well, and if if there's you know a, a UK or European um, equivalent, then um, then I, I would assume it'd be just as good. Like moon cheese is just the I haven't come across anything else or like a compar- comparable brand. You know, I'm, I'm sure there are those in the food business that have seen this and seen its success. I mean, you can find it in Starbucks now, right? So it's not getting missed by people in the food business. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a, you know, a comparable product available yeah, maybe yeah. in your market if you can't get it there, right? But we can put it out to our listeners. If they know what or go right. look, look up Moon Cheese and if you know something that looks like that, then let us know so we can find it. It, it is made in the US. So mm. that's uh, it's, uh, probably uh, the, why we can't find one here. It, Adam, I wanted to... Uh, I, I'm just from listening to your podcast over there from my discussion with Joseph and now from speaking to you to, to you right now I am even I'm just I'm so excited about the prospect of going next year and I, mm-hmm. I I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to telling the listeners about it through the podcast when we get there uh, but I want to move on from that to something which I know you you're probably bored of speaking about this now because you've talked about it so much in recent uh, in recent weeks and months and that is the the banning or restrictions mm-hmm. on grizzly bear hunting. I bet you could you could you probably preempted what I was going to ask you there. Um, <laughs> in, in BC, now we I gave a very brief rundown for our listeners a few weeks back, which mostly was um, sort of cherry picked from conversations that you were having. I know that you had um, Shane on to speak specifically about this, but from in your words, being quite immersed in it and having had a lot of conversations with a lot of different people about it, just give our listeners an idea of what is going on there and how your sort of opinion uh, and mind on it has, has shifted from initial reaction to what it is now. Cause I know from your conversations that it has morphed somewhat. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not ready to to take heads uh, as much as I was at the beginning of it. Um, and before I answer the, or we dive into that, Byron, I, I, it occurs to me that I should I should be fair to JP. If he listens to this, he's probably going to have my head because I make it sound like you know 
New Zealand is this, you know, incredibly scary, serious endeavor. And, and I fear that um, people may listen to that and think, well, shoot, I wanted to go, but now I don't. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, uh, point number one is like any very competent guy, JP can tailor a hunt to the client, right? So, um, and that's one of the interesting things with New Zealand is you can, you know, have as hardcore wilderness experience as you want, or you can have something that's a little bit more approachable because, you know, there is access to, um, very large chunks of, of private land that will still be very, you know, wild and free range, but they're, they're just, you know, private land. Um, and in those scenarios, the, the hunting isn't necessarily going to be what I just described. Um, and I, and my, my friend James that came with me, he and I basically said like, we want the hardest thing you can throw at us. Right. And we had a plan A, B and C and our plan A, um, had to change because of weather. And this is one of the other really unique things about New Zealand is you can be like, we were literally 48 hours from leaving and, um, JP emailed us and said, yep, plan A is out. West coast is getting absolutely hammered by, um, a storm system. We're going to have to go somewhere else, but that didn't change where we flew into. That didn't change where we drove from, it just changed where we ended up. Um, and we, you know, lost uh, essentially zero hunting time with that. So that's a really different thing about New Zealand. Cause if you say book a, you know, a BC or an American hunt, you know, you get what you get as far as weather. Right. Um, and there's not a whole lot of, there's a lot of flexibility as far as location, um, and, um, and style of hunts. Um, so it's a, like New Zealand is a place that if you're, if you're interested in wilderness and mountains, like you do, you got to check it out. You got to put it on your bucket list. And, um, it doesn't have to be as, you know, as in, as intense or severe as it was for me, that was just the, the sort of experience we were after and then throw in the bow hunting side of it. And that just added to it. Right. Um, mm. Yeah, that's so, the ultimate you know, challenge there, we, isn't it? Taking taking tar with a bow up on top, up yeah, on those mountain tops. Yeah, and we wouldn't have had to get into some of that terrain if I'd if I'd had a rifle, right? I mean, we might have had to, if, you know, let's say I, I anchored a bull where he was standing, then yeah, we would have had to go up and get him. But you know, odds are, you know, in, in that sort of terrain, you you shoot one and they're gonna they're gonna slide or fall a bit, right? So, um, so yeah, just I want to be real real clear to people that, you know, it's not like, you know, the hardest of the hardcore hunts out there and, <laughs> and don't reach out to JP cause I've scared you. you know, <laughs> don't be uh, put sockless. off. Yeah. No, for, for, for me, that's just enticing, <laughs> but right. uh, yeah, right. I, I, yeah, I, I'm sure we're going to try and have him possibly on before we right. go to tell people a little bit about what we're going to be encountering. But funny enough, he did actually say what you just um, explained to us is that it's good. It might change on the day. And he said, you know, the the plan can be we we do a basically a hike out sort of uh, eight days, you know, hiking a big loop round to hunt, but the weather might dictate we do something, and it sounds very much like that's what happened to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we ended up on the leeward side of the of the Southern Alps, um, and the day we hiked in, it was just torrential rain, as as you guys have seen in that in that short film. Um, and I remember turning to Tim, who was a, a guide working with Joseph on the hunt, great, phenomenal guy, uh, Tim the Butcher, as we called him. Um, his last name is Butcher. Um, but um, we got into the hut and we were just like drowned rats. And I turned to Tim and I say, Tim, you know, how much, uh, how much rain do you think we saw? And like, you know, living in BC, I thought I, and I used to live on the coast, I don't anymore, but living on the coast of BC, I, you know, I, I thought I'd seen rain, right? We'd get, you know, in Vancouver, we'd get 40 mil days and that would be, you know, go build your ark type of stuff, right? Um, but Tim turns to me in, in t typical key, or sorry, a dry Kiwi fashion. I won't even try to butcher the the <laughs> accent. He's just like, oh, you know, uh, two, 250 mils, <laughs> right? Which is just an insane amount of rain. And and then I kind of looked at him and I go, are you kidding me? He's like, no, no, that's, you know, not much. I'm like, well, what about the West Coast? Because we'd planned to be on the West Coast. West Coast. And he said, oh, they'll probably get four to 500 mils of rain in this storm. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, so, I mean, weather-wise, like when you hear people say, oh, you adjust for the weather. This isn't like, uh, yeah, you know, it's cloudy and maybe I can't see anything. It's like, no, like <laughs> you, you can't go, right? The, the weather's, weather can be so severe there. So, um, anyways, I digress. Um on the grizzly bear thing. So the, uh, we'll start from the beginning. Um, there has always been pressure from certain, um, non-governmental organizations, you know, let's call them environmental groups. Um, and, and to an extent, the, the public, the general non-hunting public to, um, 
as they would put it, shut down, but at minimum reevaluate grizzly bear hunting in BC. Now, for a lot of people, that will simply be known as trophy grizzly bear hunting. And this is a a um, a trick, um, and, it's, and it's a smart, you know, sort of psychological thing that these environmental groups do. Um, they never refer it refer to it simply as grizzly bear hunting. It's always the trophy grizzly bear hunt or the sport hunting of grizzly bears because they want to make sure that to those they're trying to raise funds from and you know exert influence upon that it is sort of demonized, right, and vilified. And so there's always been a a, a certain level of pressure to to either shut it down as they would pr- prefer or reevaluate how it's conducted. Um, and uh, you know every few years or I should say every spring um, the they they put a big push on and you know in terms of their PR and media outreach, the media outlets pick it up and there's all sorts of discussions around you know, shutting down the, the trophy grizzly bear hunt and grizzly bears are endangered, which is patently false. Um, and, and all this sort of, um, misleading information. Now, what, what happened this year was, um, it, here in BC, we had a new provincial government, um, um, voted in. And it's a bit of a weird story in that regard, because the presiding party, the incumbent party, um, actually won by, I think like one seat or by a very small margin the 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 primary opposing party um lost by one seat and then there's a third party we have in here in BC that um is sort of like you know the little kid that could <laughs> but they've been they've been they've been growing um in popularity they 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 have some really interesting things in their platform it's it's interesting um i, I don't think we've talked about this on the podcast but elements of their platform and and they would be construed as not ultra left but very left in certain regards, um, very left leaning politically. I mean, um, but if you dive into a lot of their thoughts on the environment and wildlife management, they actually probably have a lot, um, in common with the, like the true, you know, hunting and conservation community. Um, so that's just a bit of a side note, but, um, they won, um, more seats than they ever had. And so what ended up happening was the, um, the, the, the main opposing party, which had lost by one seat and this, this little, little party that could ended up forming a coalition and therefore formed a majority government. So, so which is perfectly legal and normal. And that's just, you know, the, the politics game. We, we have, game. It, we have and, it here right and so, now. <laughs> what's that? We, we have a coalition essentially, uh, co- well, we had a coal- a proper coalition between two parties, uh, four years ago. And as it stands right now in our Westminster government, we it's have, we have a the same thing. Yeah, happened. same thing. Small basic, guys that no one had yeah, heard yeah. of before. <laughs> uh, propping up, up the government. Propped yeah. up the government. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's, and so, you know, some, you know, people that are, you know, I guess, um, remain ticked off about this. will say, you know, they, they sort of stole the government. You know, my, my initial reaction was probably something to that effect, but, um, you know, it's, it's the system and they work the system to their benefit. So, so that, that's only, that's an important point, but I hate to bore people with this sort of, you know, regional politics or, you know, provincial but politics it was the in catalyst, Canada, but wasn't it for this happening? Sorry. It was the catalyst for what you're about to tell us about. Well, it opened the door, right? So it, it opened the door for this decision to happen. So, um, what is a very, very important misconception by those who don't live in BC, let alone in, in Canada is that this was like a, like a a um an electorate vote right to use sort of like a u.s term is they they pooled all the sort of the senators and whatever together um or members of parliament in our case and they held a vote and it was 90 percent in favor of closing the um of shutting down or restricting i should say the grizzly bear hunt which is not not the case um because this government holds um, a majority now they can um, essentially push through um, just about anything they want i mean that's that's a massive oversimplification there's all sorts of you know things that would um would not that would not be doable with but um if they have a, enough support within their party they can get things pushed through that simply can't be voted down from the other side yeah and and so um, what happened was, you know, uh, so there's this governmental change. Um, and as I, as I outline, um, every year there is this pressure to, um, to either shut down or, re- or heavily restrict and, and at a minimum reevaluate the, the so-called trophy hunting of grizzly bears. Um, well, the, the NGOs or environmental groups that are behind that, um, are obviously, uh, very much in favor of certain political parties. Um, uh, and, 
the um, the party, the main opposing party that formed the coalition and allowed them to take the government, um, had ran on a platform that included um, yeah, a reevaluation, reassessment, and potential you know restriction or closure of this so-called trophy grizzly bear hunt. And typically, these decisions are made on the basis of um, scientific wildlife management. Right? Studies are conducted, um, non um, you know non private non-privately funded parties are brought in, i.e. government agencies are brought in or universities are brought in to study something. Um, and uh, and then decisions are made based on, you know, facts, st- statistics, or at least uh, models that are um, considered to be reasonably accurate. Yeah, you'd think that would but be the logical way forward. And, that, and, that, and, that, and that's what logical. you guys do, right? I mean, that's what historically, generally historically, speaking, exactly, yeah. Historically, that is the only way wildlife management decisions are made. Um not not the only way, as, as Shane pointed out in the podcast I did with him, there are exceptions to this, you know, if you look across Canada and probably around the world. Um, but, you know, in, in North America, the overwhelming majority of wildlife decisions are made in that way, right? Scientific based wildlife management. Um, and I'm not saying that's perfect, right? A lot of them are models, right? So they're, you know, they take a pocket of, a, of an area, they do a, you know, a survey account, whatever the case may be, maybe they radio call or some, some animals, and then they extrapolate that um, across a much broader area. So it's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's still at least scientific and based on, you know, or research and work based on people who've been doing this their entire life. Um, what happened with this one is, um, the uh, those NGOs, environmental groups that um, are, are so opposed to the uh, again so-called trophy grizzly bear hunt, were doubling down on their media and PR um, initiatives. Right, so it was just everywhere. It was you know basically the the notion of bear hunting, period, but in particular grizzly bear hunting, was being demonized and vilified almost everywhere you look. And they're bringing in big corporate partners and all this sort of stuff. And it was you know you couldn't walk around a city like Vancouver without coming across something. Um, to this year or the, the discuss this topic it, in the sorry, lead up to, to the, it, interrupt you there, Aaron, but and when you say you couldn't uh, walk around without seeing it how were you seeing it was it on billboards buses that kind of thing or like bus stops you mean in um you know I'm, I'm virtually i mean any paper that you know was sort of on the left or um side of the political spectrum would be running material about it there were op-eds coming out from some of the heads of these environmental groups basically denouncing everything about the North American wildlife conservation model, which is just in, in, insane, really, if you if you really drill down to it. Um, they were just getting a lot of press. And of course, on a social media level, that's where they were spending the bulk of their time and money, and it was coming up everywhere. I don't engage in certain channels or certain um, um, parts of social media. Um, I do in others, like Instagram, I'm, I'm a definite user of, but say Facebook, I don't use as much, and my wife does. And she'd always be like once a week at least be like, hey, did you see this about grizzly bears or this about you know black bears or whatever? So there was a big, big push, a real tsunami of material put out um, to and, – and I can only put it this way. And this will sound uh, unobjective, um, but now that you know sort of um, <laughs> the, the, my blood has ceased boiling, I can say this very objectively. Um, it was a, it was a, a, a complete and, and – concerted attempt to mislead the public without any exaggeration that is it's going to sound biased because i'm a hunter but if you go and look at the material they put out on their websites and they put out into the public it is absolutely positively false in most cases so um they 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 played dirty and 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 they won so so what happened was so they're they're doing that uh, you know sort of tactically let's say um and then the um, they started to push forward these initiatives to the government, saying, you know, you ran on this platform that you're going to reassess the grizzly bear hunt, um, and they'd start putting out polls, public opinion polls. And with the way they're worded, is you know anyone that knows anything about surveys and polls, with the way they're worded, it was impossible for somebody that wasn't a hunter to to vote against grizzly bear hunting because it would always include trophy grizzly bear hunting, sport hunting of grizzly bears. Uh, I think one of them was worded. Are you in um, uh, on the uh, provincial trophy grizzly bear hunt? Are you a in favor of the hunting of grizzly bears for their hides, heads, and skulls only, or do you feel that hunting for subsistence is, um, you know, a, a valid way of life? Which I mean, there's only one way a non-hunter will answer that, right? Yeah. Um, and so the, the what what sort of tipped the scales was they took these opinion polls. 
um, and said 90% of the BC population, of the, the BC public, is against the grizzly bear hunt. And then the government said, well, hmm, shoot, I mean, we should probably listen to this. If 90% of the public is against this, and I'm sure they conducted their own you know, studies and polls, et cetera. But the, but the, you know, the, the, the mental war had been won, uh, or at least mental battle had been won, and people were so um, skewed as far as how um, you know, this, 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 um, this hunt specifically, grizzly bear hunting, um, was, um, was being per- portrayed that um, the government made the decision to restrict the hunt um, based on public opinion only. Nothing to do with science. And they have since acknowledged the fact that it is um, you know, sustainable on the basis of the science. Um, you know, one of the things that has come out when I talk about, you know, the, the outright lies on some of these, um, environmental group websites is, you know, they were claiming the grizzly bear population was well below 10,000. I think even some of them were claiming there was only five to 7,000, whereas all the scientific studies from a variety of agencies, agencies were claiming at least 15, if not 20,000. And it's been since acknowledged that yes, the higher number is accurate. So, um, the, uh, the decision was based on public opinion, um, not on science, and it was based, uh, and that public opinion in turn was um, very, very, very misled by very concerted and well-funded efforts um, by a, a number of um, you know NGOs or environmental groups. It's uh, funny when you talk about polls because uh, in in this country uh, they're bringing back uh, the links right now. And uh, when they brought out their polls saying 80%, 90% of the British public want uh, want the links back, uh, we first find out that the first poll was sent to uh, people that live around the area and people in the countryside. We still haven't found a person that's got that poll. And then we right. find the second poll, they basically stood in the middle of London. I don't know if it was London, but it was a city centre. And right. the question right. was, would you like to see links back in the UK? Well, most people are going to go, yes. Yeah, they're pretty and furry. Why not? Yeah. Especially if you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That they're, you know, they're 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 a big cat. They're killing machines, right? Yeah. Like, as 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 a quick funny side note, I had somebody say this to me recently. Um you know, just to to maybe put it contextual to people that think, you know, what what's the problem with a big, you know, or a mid-sized, let's say predatory cat? So, somebody had said, you know, what's the difference between a dog and a cat? And I would, of course, go, well, I don't know. And they say, well, if your cat, if your dog was as big of a, as big as a horse, you walk into the house and that stupid thing is still jump up on you and try and lick your face. <laughs> if, your cat, if your house cat was as big as a horse, it would absolutely slit your throat the first second you walk in that, in that door. Right? Yeah. And, and it's, yeah, I mean, they're, they are, and I mean this in, a, in the most like respectful manner. I mean, the, you know, the, the mid to large size predatory cats are, are killing machines um, and that doesn't mean they're bad. Like I'm not a, I'm not somebody, you know, you see out of the U S like when it comes to wolves, smoke a pack a day. Yeah. Like, I, I hate that stuff. Um, um, but you know, you, as, as was evidenced with the reintroduction of the wolves in Yellowstone for humans to think that we can fully understand what happens when we change something in the natural environment. So the introduction or reintroduction of a species or changing a, uh, you know, a, a hunting season that is, you know, scientifically based has shown to be um, producing an increase in grizzly bear populations. They are increasing and have been for years, not decreasing. Um, so we could, we, you know, we would call that well managed. Um, but for humans to think that we're going to have a, a, a full understanding or a full grasp of all the permutations of what happens in that ecosystem is the most, you know, self-centered, neurotic thing that I think you know we can do. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, we we've covered the links thing quite a lot on this podcast, but there was a lot of misinf. I suppose I could call it misinformation put out by the groups trying to reintroduce links, and they've gone a long way along the road now because they've managed to get one of the big uh, financial institutions to provide them with insurance uh, for any sheep that are killed, which was one of the big arguments for consideration. Uh, but just going back to what you were saying about. Um, the success of the management principles increasing populations of your grizzly bears it, it almost strikes me that these environmental groups or animal rights type groups that were pushing this uh, banning or restriction uh, restrictions on hunting it's almost like they don't like success well no I, it, no it, it's absolutely true and at the end of the day i, I had a 
a subscriber to, our, to the Journal of Mountain Hunting sent me an article that we're actually going to be running in the October issue later this month that um, is a really phenomenal piece on conservation versus pseudo-conservation. Um, and he gives a, a litany of examples in it of, of you know, true conservation, which you know, simply is, does the money raised end up on the ground, period, right? Um, whereas pseudo-conservation is where does that money raised – rarely if ever ends up on the ground you know in, in the order of priority if the money raised goes back into raising more money then you're not working with a true conservation group um, second is if that money raised goes into media and pr to um, push their platform and that's not true conservation if that money raised goes into um, science but science funded by their own group that has nothing to do with a um, a like a formal education institution or a, or a government agency, then you have to question the validity of that science because as we all know, and look, like I'm not saying every university study doesn't have some form of backing from a large corporate donor. That that happens, right? I mean, let's just talk about pharmaceuticals for a minute, right? Um, or you know, um, uh, surgical implants and things like that. I mean, that, that that's just the way the system works. But um, there needs to be a certain element of arm's length involvement. Um, and and as I was saying earlier, when when they, uh, some of these, um, co so, you know, so-called conservation groups, what I would now call pseudo conservation groups or extremist environmental groups, um, when they would put out statistics, they, I mean, I knew them to be false. They would quote scientific papers or, you know, so-called scientific papers, um, that claim certain numbers, but then that person's, you know, the chief scientist for the environmental group, there's a bit of a, a bit of a, um, of an issue there. Right. Um, and so the uh, the fact is, with a lot of these groups, they're in the business of raising funds. They're not in the business of um, of, of making a difference on the ground. Um, and that's a that's a huge distinction between true conservation organizations like um, the Wild Sheep Foundation, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Mule Deer Foundation, Boone and Crockett Club, um, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. I mean, I'm obviously listing off North American entities. Wild Sheep Society of BC. I mean, these are groups that are considerably, I mean, some of those won't be underfunded compared to these environmental groups. They, they, they have quite the war chess. Um, some of those bigger names I mentioned, like the Wild Sheep Foundation or Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. But some of the more regional ones um, are fighting tooth and nail to to get money to do projects that are going to improve habitat, and, habitat excuse me, and wildlife. Um, and yet, you know, these groups will you know, they're smart, right? They they go to the communities and, and locales that um, that that they know they're going to have a uh, sort of an open audience um, within, and um, and then they just go after it, right? And so it's um, it's a real mess. And I think it's really important to clarify that you know when it, so the, the the grizzly bear hunt has not been banned or shut down um, as of November 30th this year. Um, you will no longer be able to take hide head and claws out of the bush or the mountains or the inlet, wherever you, you take your bear, you can take the meat. Now that's, that's not a bad thing. Like taking the meat, I think is a positive thing. Some hunters I know, um, in North America would agree with me that, you know, you shouldn't have to take bear meat out, which uh, we could go around in circles on that topic. So let's just put that aside. I think it's a positive given today's landscape, um, yeah. social landscape that we should take the meat out of any bear. Um, but it makes no sense to leave hide, head and claws behind. That's just wasteful. Um, and so what that does mean and why that's important to the environmental groups is they think that's going to stop people from so-called trophy hunting them, right? So to hunting them just for the hide and the head and the picture and the, you know, the, the, whatever the, um, the ego boost, um, they think this will, um, um, this will change that. But what's interesting is, they were pushing for an outright shutdown. Um, what ended up happening is the government, thankfully, didn't do this. And this is sort of where my my you know anger is kind of reduced, and in particular from that discussion I had with Shane, um, they uh, they they were open and honest and said, like, look, this is a science based. This is based on you know social perception, social opinion, and we're not going to shut it down outright. You can still hunt them. You just got to take the meat and leave the hide, head, and claws. Um, so what's um, what, what, what's, what's been interesting since this decision happened is, um, so we had the NGOs and environmental groups pushing for outright closure. They didn't get that. They got this restriction. They've now come out and said that they're going to push as hard as they ever have before for outright closure because they think the meat, 
um, re requirement is just a loophole. So they, you know, the way they would put this, and this is obviously not the way I would agree, agree is, you know, the, the rich white American trophy hunter is going to still come up here, still shoot a bear, get the pictures he or she wants with it, and then throw the meat in the bush after they get take it out. Right. That, and that's what they literally will say to people. And they will literally put that kind of information out there that meats getting thrown in dumpsters or thrown in the bush because they've, you know, legally they've satisfied that requirement, supposedly legally satisfied that requirement. It is actually illegal to dump that meat. So they don't actually have their facts straight on that regard. But um, they think that that's a loophole. Right. So they're pushing for outright closure, period. They don't think this is enough. And we also know that they have said behind closed doors that we're coming for black bears next. Wow. Um, and, and there are a lot of black bears in, in BC, let alone in Canada and the rest of the U S there is no, there's no endangerment of the grizzly bears. Like I want to make sure that's really clear to people that don't understand the situation. They are not endangered. That is scientific fact proven time and time and time again. And, and so, but moving on from that, and the black bears, I mean, there's there's zero shortage of black bears. I mean, there's some areas where they've maybe been extirpated from their um, historical range, but for the most part, black bears are doing very, very well. Um, and uh, But we know that they want to come for them next. So the whole point of that rant is what they have achieved with this this decision, by, by steering this decision, is they have, they have um, um, put in place a blueprint for how things can be changed. Um, they've, they've kind of beat us at our own system in a way because as hunters, we're so focused on, um, you know, the wildlife and you know, the scientific wildlife management. Um, and they now said, well, shoot, we can't beat them on that. How can we beat them? And they did, um, with this public opinion side of things, right. Awesome. And, you know, the, awesome. the link side of it, you know, there's a, is a similar example, right? They didn't pull people in communities that might have a different opinion. They pulled people in communities that don't know any better. And of course, when a fluffy f furry, you know, wild cat to be reintroduced somewhere that, you know, will until it starts killing all their pet rabbits and dogs and all that sort of stuff, then they're going to have a different opinion. Right. Um, and so it's a, it's a scary proposition for how this can spill over to other areas of the world, in my opinion. Yeah. It's, as far as I know, it's one of the only examples that I can think of where, although it wasn't, it didn't swing fully in the direction uh, where something has happened where there has been no evidence to back it up. It has been solely a knee-jerk um, hearts and minds reaction based on fantastic PR by the sounds of it. I don't really know of any other good examples with regard to wildlife that I can think of where it's the, um, Sorry, Byron, but Shane pointed out this in the podcast he did with me is uh, the seal hunt in the Maritimes in, uh, uh, of Canada. You're right, yes. Yeah. Yes, no, you are. Which, you're I, which right. I didn't know either. Like I, I was saying the same thing as you were. And he said, you know, Adam, there, there is, there is um, precedent for this, right? And, and he made a strong point that, and in fact, it was the, the social norms um, of Europe that dictated that, not yeah. even Canadian or, or American, um, you know, sort of, or, or the Canadian or, or American cultural landscape. It was, it was, that was driven by um, European sentiment, sentiment. Yeah, because it was it was out with a cultural norm that we basically didn't understand. Right. Uh, and actually, now that I'm saying this, I'm just thinking to myself that they just closed they closed down all the big game hunting in Botswana, and that had nothing to do with science either. So right. I was I was probably um, speaking a bit too quickly there. But the point is that it's a very and it just exactly what you just said. It's a very dangerous precedent to set because if we are not following the best science and the best evidence and making decisions uh, based on what is good for the environment and the wildlife and by virtue of the fact that the the environment seems to be doing fine and more important and and importantly alongside that the grizzly bear, bear population has been sustainable harvestable and increasing then mm -hmm. why would you want to change that model i don't it makes no sense to me and i would think the vast majority of public, if they could actually sit down and have some sort of conversation at length that wasn't two lines on a billboard with a, a grinning trophy hunter, in inverted commas, uh, and a dead bear, they probably would understand that too. And the fact that it's incredibly wasteful to leave fur and hide and anything else. Surely, well, I mean, historically, and I'm sure you've covered this on your podcast, probably with Shane, we used everything. If, if yeah, anything, absolutely. we are incredibly bad these days at utilizing everything. We should be doing our utmost to utilize more and more of what we we uh, consume and take life from. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. I mean, I, 
I would I would think you guys would know I couldn't agree more with that. And it's a, you know, and people have a hard time getting over the, the notion of a, uh, we'll just use the you know, the common term a trophy, right? Um, and and we, you know, I I can't remember if I mentioned this on a on a podcast recently or not, but I had a really interesting conversation with a subscriber that reached out to me after my initial podcast where I was just raving mad. Um, that I, um, about this whole grizzly bear decision. And he, he kind of challenged me on a couple things I, I made or a couple points I made, I should say. And, you know, I have felt forever that we needed to, um, reframe, redefine the, the trophy conversation, right? Like sh- show people what a trophy really means, like still allowed the word trophy to be out there. Cause it's going to be that that's unavoidable, but, but reframe that discussion. And he basically said, you know, Adam, we've lost, we've lost that word, right? It, it will never come back to us in a positive way, right? We'll never be able to utilize that in a positive way. Um, and, and I, you know, as much as it pains me to admit it, because I know the historical significance of uh, so-called trophy hunting and what that actually means and what that has meant for wildlife populations in North America in particular. Um, and that is, you know, overwhelmingly net positive as far as understanding populations, understanding the health of populations, understanding by proxy, the habitat that produces said trophy. Um, those are incredibly important, um, elements to what has informed, um, wildlife management decisions in North America and what, what, what has produced what is, you know, to, to many people, the ultimate hunting destination, you know, outside of maybe pockets of Africa. Um, and so, uh, I have felt for a very long time that we needed to retake and, and own, um, trophy, the notion of a trophy. When this gentleman said, you know, Adam, we've lost it, forget it. And I've, and I've started to really kind of let go and, and agree with that. Um, and, and, you know, I think one of the things that people don't understand is it's not a, in most cases, yes, of course, there are people who just want a head on the wall and a picture on, you know, social media and whatever. There's, there's, there's people with different, differing tastes in every community, every sector, right? There's skiers that smoke pot before they drop into every single, you know, shoot before they, they nail it. And there's those that are like super healthy and, and train really hard, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's differing approaches to a lot of different pursuits out there. Um, but what people don't understand is that, that, that trophy, if we want to use that term, is a memento and it's a memento that outlasts any morsel of meat we take out of the bush. It is a sign of respect and it is a, an educational opportunity for friends and family members to, to have conversations around a highly, 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 highly complex topic. This cannot like what we do and why we do it and the intricacies of, you know, uh, scientific wildlife management and why certain hunt, you know, animals are hunted and others aren't and what goes into a given hunt, let's say like the grizzly bear hunt. Um, people are open to those discussions, but there has been a vacuum of information from our community around, you know, the context, right? On some of these more contentious uh, or with some of these more contentious species, right? Um, and so this, this concept of a trophy is, you know, it's on us for not recognizing that that wasn't a great term and a great label, but that doesn't mean that what that represents, i.e. I like, so I, I, on my Northern BC hunt recently, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to, to get a, a really, really nice mountain goat, like a true trophy quality mountain goat. Um, and I'm going to have that, that a high tanned and I'm going to have the, the skull clean to be a, you know, European that won't be a mount. It'll sit on, um, somewhere in the house. Um, and when I showed that to my two sons, um, one's almost four or the other one's almost two, they were fascinated by it. They were running their hands up and down the horns, looking at, you know, every little piece of this, this animal. Um, and it was, it was communicated to them via, you know, respect. Um, and, they will in turn have a respect for animals that I, any person that, you know, sits in whatever coffee shop and signs, whatever petition comes across their, you know, their phone or laptop or tablet that wants to feel environmental, they will have 10 times the respect for animals that 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 person will. Um, and so I think the notion of, of a trophy and keeping a memento of, um, of the experience, right. Of the hunt of the experience is a, a, deep and, and very, very, very connected sign of respect for the animal and the life that we've taken. And so to leave hide, head and claws in the bush is not just wasteful on, in the most basic sense. It's wasteful as far as the intangible opportunities that are produced from that, um, 
that, that, I mean, I don't want to put it this way, but that byproduct, right. Those, mm-hmm. those elements of, of the, of the kill of the take. Yeah. I mean, if anything, it's disrespectful for the kill, for the kill that you've just had or the life that you've just taken. Absolutely. Life. I mean, yeah, I think absolutely. I heard you saying, uh, recently that you never gain the same connection with your meat as you do if you've killed it yourself or you understand what it takes to kill something and put it on your plate mm. i think you were referring to you know scra- you, you'd never just scrape off a heap of meat that you've right. that you killed <laughs> yeah, into right. the into the bin and it's absolutely right you will never ever view meat on your plate in the same way again whether it be you know harvested from the wild or even you you bought it from the butcher you understand not only the life but what goes into putting it there on your plate in, in a form that you can eat it you will never look at it the same again if you are a hunter or it, even if you're not a hunter as such but if you've at least had an insight into what that means and what that experience is and uh, I think it's a it's a shame that a lot of people I know will will live and die and never ever have that connection. It might not necessarily be their fault. They might never have the opportunity to to mm-hmm. feel what that's like or the opportunity to to see and truly understand what hunting is. But without a shadow of a doubt, you you cannot have the that connection with food on your plate unless you've at least been part of a hunting experience, even if you haven't taken a life yourself. No, I completely. Agree. Agree, and I, you know, I, it's you know the the unfortunate part of it is you know because because I, I think a reasonable response to that Byron would be well you know we just have to film it right we just have to show people about it we have to tell them on podcasts right but the unfortunate state of affairs is that um, in the non-hunting public that is I'm not going to say won't be trusted but may not be trusted right they may say that was well they're just uh, they're they're producing that in a way that makes it look better than it is or something like that yeah, right that's fair um and uh and i'm not saying i agree with that i'm not saying that's necessarily the norm but there's that potential right mm-hmm. um and you guys do a wonderful job of telling the full story um it was you know what what made me want to you know start working with you guys or collaborating with you guys in every way possible is you know, the way you were portraying hunting was was very resonant with me and i think a very important um, sort of image that we need to continue, we need to really double down on, in Absolutely, my opinion, especially yeah, given this, great. this, you know, what, ha- what happened in um, BC with the grizzly bear. Um, but, and I, like, I want to be clear, I don't want everyone, I don't necessarily want everyone to hunt. Um, cause I mean, <laughs> we'd have no animals left <laughs> if everyone on the planet did, but I would love people to get to know a hunter right? Um, maybe even accompany somebody on, a, on an easier hunt. You know, maybe it's an upland hunt or something like that. Um, and, and just like find a way to reconnect with that, um, that food chain, right? We are disconnected from it. Um, and if you see like even just, you know, some birds, right? Waterfowl or upland, like, you know, there's, there's, there's a decent amount of work that goes into cleaning that up and turning that into a meal, right? Yeah. Or a rabbit or something like that, right? Um, it's nothing close to, you know, a stag or a moose or a, you know, a goat or a sheep or something like that, but there's still work there and we've been removed from that work and therefore we don't have an appreciation for, um, you know, that, that, that sustenance, right? The, you know, energy in, energy out, right? Right now it's all just, you know, energy in you don't have to really you, you go to the store you pick it up and you sit yeah, in it your doesn't take much to do that back. does it just ma- the main right. thing is the exchange of money which you probably sat down on a chair and worked for exactly yeah. right um so you know i i just i would love it if and, and maybe this is on us um i think I it think, is to be know, honest i think it is on us it is on us yeah, to yeah. to put an arm around somebody and a kind of and open the door uh, and like you were saying yeah podcast and film and make that available sorry not not available accessible to people because a lot of the films i think we talked about this before and it's been covered by quite a few people but a lot of the films that have been done in the past much less so now uh they were designed 100 percent for hunters and even as a hunter sometimes if you carried certain ethics you probably didn't want to watch them so it's about making what we do accessible and opening the door to say this is we are welcoming you in and i think it does i think it does sit on us because we can't really be, we can't really expect that greater part of the world, which is far more than there are hunters these days, in that increasingly urbanized environment that we live in, the populations uh, are getting bigger and bigger, but most of the, those densities are in cities. 
So they're going to be ever more disconnected from exactly yeah. what you've just been talking about. So I, th I think whether we like it or not, it, it lies on us. No, that's, it's a huge point. And, you know, I, I couldn't agree more, Byron. And, and, and the how of that is, I think, where... I, I thought you'd have the solution for that. That's why you've come on the podcast, Adam. That's the how. You're going <laughs> to yeah. answer that now. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have the time for this podcast if I had that solution. Um, but uh, I'd find the time, guys. I'm kidding. Um, so um, I think the how is, is, is the real next, you know, hill we have to have to climb right is because as you said i mean we have a very astute point is you know the majority of hunting media was for hunters which makes sense right i mean like yeah, of course it does yeah it, it, it makes business sense it makes you know um audience sense it, i mean it just makes sense but that's not the world we live in anymore right everything we put out can be found by somebody else and, and can be not necessarily will be but can be used against us mm -hmm. um and uh, and so it is upon us to come up with creative ways to um to, to bridge that gap, right. And to, to make things more accessible or approachable, or even just to, um, initiate conversations, um, that uh, aren't being had. Right. And yeah, so, yeah. um, you know, whether that's through film or pod, I mean, obviously it's not a weather that needs to be through film and video and podcasts. Um, the things that we write, you know, both online and print and wherever else they can be found. Um, but I think there needs to be, and I think, I can't remember if we said this off air or on air when we did the group and the group podcast with the rookie hunter guys is like as hunters, you know, I mean, geez, a grand vision would be, you know, sort of globally is to host, you know, like a, a, in a, you know, a community park or something, a giant barbecue and free, right? Everyone come on, come all, come try some game meat and, and come meet the people that, that do this and provide this for their friends and family and I think we've been, you know, we haven't humanized what we do as, as well as we should have. Um, and so it's easy to demonize a hunter because if you don't know a hunter, it's like you, you're shown, you know, the worst example of a hunter. You're like, well, screw that guy, right? Or gal. Hmm. Um, and so people don't get a chance to interact with uh, us as much as they otherwise would. Um, and then, you know, if you, like, if you think of it, if a person's getting all this grizzly bear um, material and they're like, well, shoot, my neighbor, Frank hunts black bears. Maybe I'll talk to him about it. Right. And that's, and that's, that's a powerful piece, right? Cause, cause Frank, this, you know, myth, you know, mythical Frank will probably know a whole lot about the subject. I, I would hope he would, or she would, whoever the person may be, um, and can help educate that person. And on that podcast we did with the, the swap cast with the rookie hunter guys, one of the guys, uh, Kelly had had a very similar conversation at his workplace. I, right? I recall uh, talking about that. Yeah. It was, it was amazing. The turnaround the, an, an attitude with the, the people that he'd started speaking with before and after he'd actually, um, start, you know, started having that conversation with them. No, exactly. And, and like, I literally get like I'm getting goosebumps thinking about that now, because when he told me that story, I'm like, it was like the light bulb went off and it's embarrassing for me to admit because I'm a, can be a blowhard and, you know, want to run into the fight, not away from it. Um, but like, that's where we have to spend, um, as much time as possible. But like, it's easy to say that like, Oh yeah, I just need to have good conversations with people. But you know, those, you don't walk up to your friends and say, Hey, so, um, how about that grizzly bear hunt? Right. It may, it may come up, right. Because it's, you know, whatever the thing of the day on social media, but um, I think we have to keep that front of mind is that everything we do is, is now being watched. Everything we, um, everything we put out there, um, is being consumed by people outside of the hunting community and could be used against us. We have to be in, you know, we've, we have to be in incredibly, incredibly careful with our branding, our personal branding, um, um, and more than ever before. Yeah. A hundred percent, Adam. And I think a lot of that is going to come it has to come from individual hunters in their individual lives bit by bit because it is yeah. quite a mammoth task you know whether you're you're someone with a even if you've got a media profile within the hunting community you're expecting one person to be able to reach out to that greater world or you're expecting something that someone who makes a video about something to reach out to the the greater world and they can do it and they do do it successfully but there are still a lot of hunters out there and if every single one of those hunters takes the time to speak to one or two people who don't and explain, then it's it's bound to have an effect which is just going to cascade. Absolutely. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, bottom up, not top down, right? And we've been reliant upon top down, both positively and negatively to exert influence, right? And, um, and that was one of the things that was exposed um, with this grizzly bear de- decision and restriction here in, in BC is um, we didn't have adequate resources in place and um, organizations or groups in place from a top down perspective to push back, right? Everyone was sort of standing there like, how did this happen this quickly? I mean, a lot of people thought it would happen someday. But nobody thought it would happen this quickly unless they were, you know, sort of in the system and, and in the the negotiating and, and political process already. Um, and so, you know, I had I spent when, when that decision, you know, was was made, um, uh, the announcement was made. Um, I spent hours that week on the phone trying to find a way to um, like where can I exert this energy I have to you know push back or fight back, and it was almost non-existent. And and there are group that's you know there are groups out uh, out here in BC um, that are trying, but it is there's a massive disconnect, and you know there's bureaucracy that that, that slows down, you know the ability to to take action, right? Um, and that's just you know that's just groups and organizations, that's people. Um, but I think you're 100 percent right that you know we need to re uh, sort of reframe this from a bottom up perspective um, to um, to have the 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 kind of impact we need to right and and look it's exhausting i reached out to some people some personalities in the business when the grizzly bear hunt um announcement was made and they just said ah you know i, I just don't know if i'm the guy for it right mm-hmm. i mean shane was of course not that person he would basically he within 48 it. hours yeah. Of, <laughs> was yeah was willing to get on the phone or get on a, a the podcast and discuss it um but I reached out to a few other people. They were just like, ah, you know, uh, I don't know if I want to go there and that sort of thing, right? And, you know, we, we've been leaning heavily on those sort of personalities. And, you know, we, you and I both know, or the three of us all know, that that person, is, as, may, as much as they may have, you know, a, a net positive um, perception in the community, you know they get inundated every day with BS from anti-hunters, yeah. right? And they can't, everybody cannot be expected to know everything. You and I and Daryl and all, you know, the other people who, who run podcasts, we can't be expected to have the in-depth knowledge in every single topic to do with the great outdoors and hunting and wildlife because it's just not possible. There isn't enough. Oh, yeah. Well, it might be possible to some extent if this was all I did, but it can't be all that I do. I don't. I can't just sit and research all day for podcasts because I have to do other things, you know, for to, to work it's just the same as you're, you're running the journal and everything else. So we have to be able to sort of reach out to different people who it is their an expertise and knowledge. But for what you're saying is you were you were really struggling to find the outlet of it. Shane is a is a gold mine of information and, and output when it comes to topics like that. So I suppose he, you probably found the best person for the job. To be <laughs> no, I, I sure did, and I was very grateful for his time because he's a very busy guy. But but more specifically, what I meant by that was, you know. Uh, he, you know, our own NGO, our own, you know, conservation organization or group or hunting and fishing, you know, club or community organization mm-hmm. or provincial organization that, you know, was, was ready and willing to, um, to, to make, so even just simply make a public statement, right. Get, get, get themselves in the news or on the radio or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, we, we started to initiate some fundraising efforts, um, via the journal, to basically start building as, you know, as, um, you know, aggressive a term as it is a war chest to start to fight back on the, on the right playing field. Cause we weren't even playing on the same field. No, right. No. We, we were, we were playing, we were playing you know, cricket and they were playing something without rules. Yeah. Rugby league. Right. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, anyways, it was, um, you know, there just there there was there weren't a whole lot of options. Now there are options, and you know, I know there are people working real hard on this, but um, you know, in, in most cases, you know, we were either caught with our pants down, or the organizations that should have been there for us, us as the hunting, the broader grassroots hunting community, weren't, um, and weren't because of political considerations, right? So it, it basically exposed the soft underbelly of the organization of the hunting community in BC. And and look, you know, the hunting community within BC, the resident hunting community within BC is divided on this one a little bit. I'm not going to say it's a 50-50, but there are those that that think, look at this and say, good, I don't I don't hunt grizzly bears. Nobody hunts grizzly bears for meat anyways, which is wrong, but they, they feel that way. Um, 
and uh, and or they say, okay, well that's fine. You know, I I, I only want to hunt grizzly bears for the meat anyways. I'd really, you know, I'd love to take the hide, head, and claws, but eh, you know what? Such is life. I can still hunt them. But even better is you know that the so-called rich white American trophy hunter now can't come shoot my quote unquote bears. Right. And there's that huge, huge, huge issue here in BC around residents versus non residents. Oh, of course, I forgot um, about that. Yeah. So th- there's just this melting pot of 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 issues and com- complexity that make this um I mean, really it was the perfect thing for the NGOs and the antis to come for because they knew we'd we'd struggle to get ourselves organized um to to push back on it and with the kind of speed um and organization that they have. It's probably important uh, to mention, just as we get towards wrapping this up, that we we spend quite a lot of time talking about uh, you know how the, the hunting opportunities essentially have changed and the restrictions that's been placed on that. But ultimately, what lies underneath that is is really the the long term welfare and survival of the grizzly bear itself. Uh, that's what we're right. talking about here. And I can't see it being a positive. I know that the the uh, environmentalist and, and animal rights type organizations would believe this, but I can't see logically from a management perspective how uh, banning it can be good for grizzly bears. And I think that that is the important thing that we need to make sure that the public understand because whether it be the money or the ma- the management and concern of that population, which builds off the back of being able to hunt it and making sure that there's a harvestable surplus for that hunting to be able to continue. That is what makes sure that we know what's happening with the populations, and that's exactly. what makes sure that those populations can uh, s- survive in a sustainable fashion, and we're basically keeping a check on them. Absolutely. No, it's so true. And, it, and it, look, I, I understand that people have a hard time understanding that um, – it is necessary to kill something to understand it or that somebody can kill something and love it. Right. And Stephen Ranella makes this point has made this point previously. And I can't remember where, whether it was in a book or on a podcast. He's like, what people don't understand about the hunter is when I say I love deer, right. Or I love bears. I love the, you know, the, the, the whole population of deer and bears. I want them to thrive and survive and do well and be available for me to hunt. Yes, but also for people to see. I don't necessarily love the deer that I shoot or the bear that I shoot. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not that you don't love them, but you don't, there's, there isn't that, that sort of dichotomy between, well, you say you love this thing, but then you go and, you know, you go and whack it. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's not a, it's just not that simple a, a, a scenario. But what people have to understand is, you know, there's this misconception that, you know, hunters just want to kill everything that walks the planet. Well, if that happened, we wouldn't be able to do the thing that for most hunters is like your number one passion recreationally, right? Yeah. It so, would make no so sense. It, it makes it makes no sense, right? And so we are all and, – and this is the thing that frustrates the hell out of me with these, these uh, um, environmental or I would even call them extremist environmental groups, you know, on, this, on, the, on the bear issue or the wolf issues – um, is at the end of the day, we actually want a lot of the same things. I don't want to see grizzly ha- bear habitat, um, lost to industrial development or urban sprawl. I don't want to see North coastal inlets, um, you know, polluted and tarnished so that grizzly bears can't survive there. I don't, you know, I'd, pr- I'd protect that with my life, frankly, but we see very different solutions to arrive at that same end goal. And we have to question, and this is, comes back to that notion of real conservation versus pseudo conservation. We have to question what their real, um, what their real emphasis is, right? Do they actually want to protect habitat? Do they actually want to see that species thrive and even increase? And if so, are they willing to give up on some of their so-called ethics and what they, what they would consider to be higher moral ground ethics to achieve that end goal? And it, the answer is resoundingly no yeah. across. If you laid every scientific fact out in front of them and said, hunting is what allows this to happen, will you support it? They will say no. Because right? that and they, they is will more not, important to they, them. And they will not have a counterpoint for that. Um, and it's a, um, it, yeah, I mean, it, it's just a, it's a, it's a really weird scenario, but it's, I mean, it, it, it's just the scenario we find ourselves in. 
I mm. think I think questions always have to be asked for any of the, any charity. It doesn't have to be just animal rights charities. Yeah, where, where the the CEO and that are all on two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand uh, dollars or pounds a year, which is the case of many of our major organisations here: Oxfam, Save the Children, so on, so on. No, it's a great point, Joe. And you know, and and I forgot that you know, in that article that that subscriber submitted to us, he made the point is like when he talks about where that where those funds go. Um, you know, do they go onto the ground? Well, if they don't go onto the ground, where do they go? And if it's into, you know, just raising more funds, but that's basically just a, it'd be an ATM for paying people salaries to just keep this thing going, then you're not really, this is not a conservation group. It's, it's, it's an extremist group. It's an extremist environmental group. It's a protectionist group that is, um, you know, for for their own reasons, I won't say whatever reasons, for their reasons, opposed to the notion of, say, hunting bears or wolves for that matter. Um and have made it their their career choice to pursue that, um, you know, whether it's wrong or or right. Yeah, no, um, it's it, a quick a quick stat I wanted to to mm-hmm. throw out that I, I forgot when I went rambling off there on that last point. This is a really interesting one for the listeners. Um, in hunted populations, uh, sorry, let me back that up. Grizzly bear mortality is higher in outright protected populations than in hunted populations. So if you think about the big parks here in Canada, everyone that you know from the UK or Europe that listens to your podcast will know Banff. They'll know ja- Jasper. Bear grizzly bear mortality rates are higher in those parks than anywhere else in Canada, and they are protected. Hmm. It's because they have constant human conflict. Grizzly bears are grizzly bears. They're going to do what grizzly bears do. They're not, you know, vicious. And, um, you know, evil creatures are beautiful, incredible creatures. Like seeing them in the wild is, I saw one on this recent hunt, a sow and a cub. And just like, I was in awe. I stopped glassing for goats and sheep because I just was, a, you know, absolutely absorbed by this grizzly bear. Um, and, uh, and so they have these, these human bear conflicts in a lot of these national parks and they end up being euthanized. Sometimes they're moved, right? But their, the mortality rates are higher where they are protected than where they are not. I did not know that statistic, but that is fascinating. Uh, just uh, just to go back, just before we, we wrap this up, Adam, because it's the start of your day, and I know you've got lots of things to do. <laughs> uh, and well, we've, more uh, importantly, you guys, you guys have more have uh, some social things to no, get that, to. No, oh, no, it's, it, that's okay. Um, but what I just wanted to say is just in the interest of, of balance, because I think it is so important uh, as hunters and as hunting organizations that we – be as honest and open and transparent as possible about what we do. And when you're Mm -hmm. referring to, and as as Daryl pointed out, about organizations with high salaried CEOs and uh, the sort of wheel of we get money in just so that we can employ more people, you have some fantastic organizations uh, that you mentioned some of them over in the States, which are very, very heavily involved in conservation. That's what's at their core. We really do not have that here in the UK. The, the best one that I can name is the GWCT. And basically, or, or they've got very uh, low staffing. And that is where their, their money goes. And it goes into to conservation and, and research and science. Most of the rest of our organizations, I would say quite a lot of them are actually guilty of it too. And that's our hunting organizations here. And I think that we need to be honest about that within our own communities and sit back and say, well, you know what? How many people do you guys employ? How much money are you bringing in from your members? And where is that money going? Because I don't see it. I'm talking about here in the UK. I do not Mm -hmm. see a lot of that going into conservation, even if conservation might be in the, the title of a name or that is the the push that is done on social media you know, we're, we're all very keen to say i'm a hunter i'm a conservationist i think a lot of people just say it because it's a strap yeah, line course, now yeah. they of don't course, actually yeah. ever do anything which embraces what that means and i don't necessarily mean that you've got to go and you know fix up a bit of habitat to be a conservationist but at the very least you need to start being able to educate yourself so that you can have conversations with people about the benefits of what other hunters and other organizations are doing. You know, that is still being a conservationist by the fact that you're educating yourself on it. But a lot of people don't do that. And I think even our own organizations, and I'm sure you'll have some in the States, just as I've been picking up them here, where maybe they are guilty of that too. And I think we need to be honest about that. Oh, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, the simplest way to put this, you know, no, we're, we're far from perfect, right? And um, we're not saying it's our, our, our way or the highway. I think, you know, I think the opportunity going forward, you know, you asked me, you know, where is, where, where is, where, where is my head at opportunity going forward is as, as Shane put it in the podcast, 
reaching across the aisle, finding the moderates, right? You know, to use a, a, an outright political term that we can start to build relationships with and put um, a plan in place that is best for what we supposedly all want, the wildlife, right? The habitats and the wildlife. And, and that's, you know, without trying to go down a rabbit hole here, just quickly, one of the things, the key points that gets lost in this grizzly bear discussion is, you know, that was a, a an animal-based decision that did not in any way, shape, or form consider habitat. And habitat is the most important consideration when you are making a scientific-based um, decision. Because if they, you can do, you know, you can keep transplanting caribou or elk into somewhere, but if they don't have the habitat to survive, they're not going to survive. Um, so habitat is, is absolutely an, an integral uh, and integral piece of this. Um, and the, so well, I wanted to give you a couple of quick examples, um, of, you know, where the money goes. So wild sheep foundation, who we've worked with for a very, very long time, you won't believe this for every dollar donated or raised, they put four on the ground. I've heard that on your podcast. It's outstanding. It's outstanding work. Yeah. Uh, RMEF, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, I don't know what that statistic is, but a number of years back, they sent out a, a magazine and they had protected or conserved. Now, yeah, protected can, can be misinterpreted, but they had conserved, i.e. protected from industrial or, or um, developmental um, um, sprawl. So industrial development or, you know, urban sprawl um, or, you know, real estate development. Um, over 2 million acres, 2 million acres in the United States. Yeah, that's a massive piece of country. And that's not just for elk so people can hunt them. That's helping trout. That's helping upland species. That's helping, you know, ground squirrels and other rodents, et cetera. Um, and so these are just, you know, critical things that um, I guess the thing I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make there is when you really are vested in the um, the wildlife outcome, they they get the job done right? Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, right? There's probably some things that could be made more efficient or more productive, but they're doing a pretty darn good job um, when compared or stacked against some of these pseudo conservation organizations. Um, and that's an incredibly important you know, question a person needs to ask themselves or those around them when they say, hmm, should I support this initiative or this group is, you know, dig into it. And that's, you know, that's one of the big problems is we don't do the sort of the, the deep research on subjects um, like we once used to, right? You don't get long editorials in newspapers and people don't read them anyways. Um, like you used to get, it's, you know, what's the, the eight seconds of attention I can devote to something that gets fed to me on Facebook or wherever. And then, you know, you have a gut or knee jerk reaction to it and then you move on. Right. And, and it, you know, this is a highly, highly, highly complex subject that is not something that you can understand in eight seconds, which for for the record, is the average you know online user's attention span these days, and and so, therein lies therein lies the issue, and in fact therein lies the challenge of how do we exactly uh, how do we reach out to these people in a changing world, and that is something which uh, Sh Shane brings up, and uh, you've mentioned it plenty of times, is that we have to adapt our messages and our narrative for the world that we live in today. It's not what it was twenty thirty years ago. No, it's, no. And that's it. It's a, it's a, it, in a way, it's as simple as that because we have a great story. We've got great science that backs up the vast majority of what we do. And as you said, somewhere near the start of this podcast, we've been communicating it badly. And yeah. uh, you, you and I, and all the other people who do podcasts, I hope that those podcasts provide fuel and, and ammunition in a way for all the listeners to be able to have educated debate. That is indeed why we started this podcast. And everybody who, who writes and even just sits down around a table and has a conversation can take something from one another so that they can take it on to have further conversations, hopefully with people outside of our community. Um, that's ultimately how I think we will move forward and survive as hunters in what is a modern world. Indeed. I couldn't agree more. Adam, uh, I could very, very easily speak to you for another hour and a half. I, as we were uh, speaking here, I wrote down a couple of things that I wanted to go back and cover again. And I haven't even got to them. <laughs> so I'm just going to have to have you back on the show again, which I'm sure I guess, uh, I guess, or you are my guest, I'm sure our listeners will not object to. So at some point, uh, again, probably fairly soon, if you don't mind, we'd love to have you on again. Oh, I'm, I'm always honored to come on. And uh, I, I will apologize for... Um 
my long windedness. I mean, this is the, the nature of asking another podcaster onto your <laughs> podcast, right? Is <laughs> you don't have don't to pull, pull you don't have to pull information out of them. But I, I hope I just, certainly hope I didn't bore people or anything along those lines. It's um it's obviously uh, a series of topics within this broader hunting discussion that uh, I feel very strongly about, and I'm you know. I, I, just what you guys are doing is so important and I've got the utmost respect for your show, your platform and the message you're putting out there. So thank you for what you do and thank you for having me on. No, uh, likewise, Adam, you know, you got, you're doing very similar stuff and I enjoy listening to your shows, enjoy reading your content. So thank you and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you, sir. I, uh, I, will, I look forward to our next one. And that's it for another two weeks. Don't forget... We are out normally every two weeks on a Thursday, uh, but we apologize again for, for the delay. We are on SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, Podcast Addict. Well, someone was asking me the other day what we were on, and uh, the list is huge. And if we are not on a device or a platform that you want us to be on, ask us and we'll put you on. Bar Spotify, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Oh, that's quite difficult, isn't it? Very difficult. They basically only pick the top 10 from um, iTunes, which is like your BBC programs and stuff like that. Okay, so everything else is doable if we haven't done it already. And we would very, very much like you to leave us some reviews. We actually have a lot of reviews already, but more is always welcome. And uh, we haven't heard from you guys for, and sub- for a while. subscribe, actually. If you're a new listener to the show, subscribe. Subscribe and reviews are actually very important for us to uh, go up the rankings, go up the yeah. ranking and stuff like that. So, and also, if you subscribe, it means that as soon as an episode is out, it comes up on your phone and uh, reminds you and reminds you that the latest episode is out. So it means in situations like this, when it's late, you know it's out. Yeah. So that would be fantastic. And as always, we love to hear from you. Even if it's not leaving us a review, we get a lot of messages um, across Facebook and Instagram. Yep, emails as well. So if there's something that's on your mind, if there's something you particularly liked, or more importantly, something you would like to have on the show. We had one recently. Um, there was a gentleman who he wanted us to get somebody on to talk about uh, stalking in Scotland, and he was particularly interested about using the Garens. And I think it was had been because of a lot of the pictures that Daryl had been putting up on, on Instagram. Yep. Um, so we haven't done that yet, but it's not going to be too difficult to do that because we have access to a lot of people around here um, who are very well versed in just that. So we will, we are going to do that for you. Any suggestions you bring on board, we, we will take. Uh, you can email the show, as Byron was saying, at podcast at paceproductionsuk.com or you can send us an email on any of the social medias. Uh, there's actually forms on the website as well that you can fill in, the pacebrothers.com. Uh, don't forget to enter this podcast competition, which was to win a Tipton cleaning rod. Uh, we always have lots of entries. And if you haven't won before, and if you've, more importantly than that, if you've never entered one, why have you never entered one? Because they run every two weeks. Go and enter this one. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and you will hear from us in two weeks' time.